Welcome to Pirate TV. Okay, so today we're talking with uh, former Congressman Dennis Kucinich. Dennis, you served eight terms in the Congress and uh, you were the former mayor of Cleveland. Uh, you've always been a courageous advocate for peace. You proposed legislation to establish the Department of Peace and you led the effort against the war Iraq war from its inception, as well as the Libyan war and the war on Syria. It, am I right about that? Well, you're correct on that. Uh, and I appreciate being with you, Ed. Thank you so much for this invite. Yes, yeah. welcome. And uh, uh, you also ran for president and I supported you in my caucus and uh, didn't get very, I didn't get to even be a delegate. So they, they slid me in as an alternate. But uh, at any rate, I had this. Uh, this well, thank uh, you for that as well. I, that was a very exciting time. Uh, and it was great to be in Washington State, where I have so many friends. And, uh, you know, I, I, what I noticed in being in Washington State is th there are a lot of similarities between uh, the state and, and where, where I'm from in Ohio. So I always felt at home. <laughs> yeah. So at any rate, so it's a very progressive area. And um, so uh, this letter that uh, Pramila Diapal, who is our, my, my Congress lady, uh, submitted to the president um, was probably a, a result of her getting some pressure, you know, from her constituents, I would assume. And um, this was signed by 30, members of the Progressive Caucus and uh, submitted to the president. And it was a very polite letter, you know, asking that the president uh, pursue negotiations, which is his job, right? And uh, it's also, yeah, I, ha I might interject here that, uh, you know, I think that's the will of the public, right? Because I don't think the public really supports a proxy war, a long protracted proxy war. And um, at any rate, I know it's controversial to say proxy war, that's supposed to be Russian propaganda, but you know, if the uh, Secretary of Defense can say it, is it controversial? I don't know. Well, you know, Ed, Ed, this is a good place to start the discussion because, um, you know, I, of course, uh, know uh, Congresswoman Jay Paul, and I'm familiar not only with her, but with her constituency. And with the substantial part of Washington State, which has always uh, been uh, uh, for two things. First of all, people want a strong defense, but they also don't want to go around the world telling other people what to do. They, and they want to, you know, it's a paradox. You can be for uh, defense up to a point, but also you can be for peace. So, uh, you know, that's what I called uh, strength through peace. And what the Congresswoman faced was, um, uh, you know, no doubt hearing from her own constituents and hearing from other members of, of the caucus that there was an interest in diplomacy, as well there should be, because. Uh, the fact of the matter is that if we don't find a place for diplomacy, this uh, contest with Russia in Ukraine could spiral out of control into uh, uh, a nuclear war. And, uh, you know, it's already cost the United States over $65 billion, and there's more coming on the way, unless yeah. Congress steps in and says no more funding. Um, you know, I... I just find it uh, rather odd at a time when so many people in America are having trouble making ends meet with inflation and the cost of fuel and the cost of food that our nation should be so immersed in this effort to uh, uh, keep us in whatever kind of war you want to call it, it's a proxy war, but the potential for being much wider in Ukraine. We've had numerous opportunities to promote uh, a peaceful agreement. 
And yet uh, the United States does not seem to be interested in that. And do we need any other proof? Then we see how quickly the efforts of 30 members of Congress were shut down by the powers inside DC. They didn't want to hear about negotiations. They didn't want to hear about diplomacy. This is all about fueling a war machine, sending untold billions over there. Uh, but as I've asked, and we'll ask again, to what end? Where are we going with this? Uh, are we ready, really, to sacrifice everything in this country um, in order to um, insert ourselves in this question about how the map should be? Or let's even back, back up. We need to start looking at what the US's involvement has been in Ukraine that may have uh, provided some push uh, towards the conflict. So, you know, there's, you, you can't keep spending this kind of money uh, and ignoring the concerns of people back home. Yeah, well, the, um, <clears throat> it's really obvious to me that the uh, United States has been pushing for this war for decades. You know, it just didn't, it didn't just start in this year in February, and it didn't start in 2014 when the United States overthrew the government and put in a, a fascist puppet government in uh, Ukraine, and then which kicked off the civil war. And then uh, it didn't, the United States has been meddling in Ukraine for, you know, like I say, for decades, you know, and, and Putin's been well aware of it. If you read his speeches, he talks about it. He's did everything he can to try to stop it, you know, but, um, you know, they, they had a color revolution in 2004, I think it was, and, uh, and installed a, an oligarch. And, um, you know, then the United States has been uh, supporting these fascist militias, you know, the uh, the right sector and, uh, you know, several other ones. And, um, you know, the Congress made legislation that they weren't going to support the Azov Battalion. That was in 2018, I think. And uh, then the Azov Battalion was just here last month, you know, lobbying Congress for more money. And uh, I was wondering if you, how many, if you know anything about that, are they going to restore funding to the Azov Battalion? Well, I, I think the question of funding is going to be uh, looked at very carefully by the next Congress. And it's quite likely that the next Congress will be uh, led by Republicans. And keep in mind, a substantial number of Republicans voted against the funding. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. But there's a bigger question here. And the bigger question is, what can we do as a people to start to create a, a new effort in our country towards uh, human and ecological security? We, we really have um, an opportunity here, if we seize it, to demand that our government take a new direction away from trying to be the king of the mountain, the nation above nations, to being a nation among nations where we work cooperatively uh, with all nations in the world. It doesn't mean that we have to agree with the policies of a given country, but it also means that we cannot expect the model that the United States has uh, developed uh, to be exported or impressed on other countries exported to or impressed in other countries. I, I'm, um, we, this really is an opportunity for us to re-inspect some basic premises about what we're, what are we about as a nation? Are we, um, is it our uh, manifest destiny to rule the world? Uh, are we ready to uh, bear the burden and pay the price for, um, and, and a, a new American imperium. Um, what does that actually mean to people who are just trying to make ends meet uh, in our own country? What does that mean to people who are trying to raise their children and give them an opportunity to have a future? Uh, see, I, I, in my close study of world events, 
I think that America has uh, reached a point where uh, our, our greater influence can be felt through diplomacy rather than through the use of our arms uh, that we cannot use nor expect the men and women who, who proudly serve in our military to, um, to be diplomats with guns. It doesn't work that way. We should not, we use them to defend our country, but we cannot expect uh, people to put their lives on a line when we haven't even tried diplomacy. It's just not fair. It's not fair to the men and women who serve. It's not fair to the taxpayers of the US. It's not fair to future generations. It's not fair to the uh, love that all of us have for our country and for America's uh, future. So we're, we're in a very uh, serious moment here, Ed. And it's good that we're having this discussion. And I just want to say, you know, Congressman Jayapal is, uh, has been a good member of Congress, but you can imagine the pressure she was put under where, where every thought of diplomacy all of a sudden is obliterated. Really? I'm sure that, um, uh, so she needs support. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I know how these things work. I served 16 years in the house. I, understand what happens when you run a fall a foul of the prevailing consensus but I have to tell you I've never seen anything quite like it where 30 members of Congress put their name to a letter one day and the next day they're told uh, they read the riot act and they end up retracting a letter that simply called for diplomacy so what does that mean it means that we the people from various constituencies we're the ones that have to demand diplomacy and if we cannot make the request to our members of Congress anymore, then we have to make the request directly to the White House. Yeah. Well, this is a big deal because, you know, the fact that you even bring up the issue of diplomacy as a, uh, a red a scarlet letter, uh, you know, that's never happened before. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but, uh, I wanted to read a little bit from this letter because the letter is actually very, very polite and very humble. We agree with the administration's perfect perspective that it is not America's place to pressure Ukraine's government regarding sovereign decisions and with the principle you have enunciated that there should be nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. But as legislatures responsible for the expenditure of tens of billions of U.S. taxpayer dollars in military assistance in the conflict, we believe such involvement in this war also creates a responsibility for the United States to seriously explore all possible avenues, including direct engagement with Russia to reduce harm and support Ukraine in achieving a peaceful settlement. In May, President Zelensky, despite deadlocked negotiations, reiterated that the war will only definitively end through diplomacy and had previously explained that any mentally healthy person always chooses the dip diplomatic path because he or she knows, even if it is difficult, it can prevent the loss of thousands, tens of thousands, and maybe even millions of lives. In conclusion, we urge you to make vigorous diplomatic efforts in support of a negotiated settlement and ceasefire, engage in direct talks with Russia, explore prospects for a new European security arrangement acceptable to all parties that will allow for a sovereign and independent Ukraine and in coordination with the Ukrainian partners, seek a rapid end to the conflict and reiterate this goal as America's chief priority. So there's new information. Uh, I was listening to Democracy Now! today and they had Ro Khanna on. And so Amy Goodman asked him if he still supported this letter. And he said, of course, you know, and it reiterated that, that that's how war, all wars end with the diplomacy anyway. So I was wondering if you we're still in the Congress, what would you be doing right now? Well, 
what I did when I was in Congress was I organized members to um, help end, end the uh, bombing of Serbia. And I organized members to uh, oppose the war in Iraq, to um, oppose a war in Libya, to, um, uh, to, to challenge the policies in Syria, to uh, try to end the war in Afghanistan. So I was active on the floor of the house and talking to members all the time and trying to get them to see the necessity of taking a, a, a different uh, path than uh, was coming from the White House where the White House was led by a Democrat or Republican. I mean, I organized on the floor of the house and, um, and, and I would always tell leadership what I was doing because it wasn't about being against them. It was about being for something. And um, of course, I think this, you know, this goes to, you know, what kind of experience you have in taking on these kind of battles because um, it's, not, it's not easy. And uh, when, when one stands in defiance of, of, uh, of the White House or congressional leaders or both, uh, you know, things can happen inside Congress with respect to your career opportunities within the institution. So, but I never let that bother me because I, I wasn't, you know, interested in, in, um, in moving up. I was interested in my constituents moving up. Um, I, so I, you know, I, I think that, uh, and I'm glad that Congressman uh, Ro Khanna uh, has uh, continued to uh, stand by that letter. Because as you've read it, Ed, and I'm sure not only me, but the people who are watching this, the letter's pretty tame. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 and it, but the, but the power of it was in uh, the repetition in so many words about the necessity of ending the war and do it through, through the use of diplomacy. So we, we're now in a, in, a, in a period where we're learning that uh, people in charge of our country don't have any interest in diplomacy. Wow, <laughs> wow. Uh, and it's not just about Russia, it's about China as well. You know, if you look at the uh, national defense strategy, you'll see that the way it's crafted is that, you know, it just projects that, you know, we're in this conflict with Russia, but the long term conflict is with China, and uh, we got to get ready for that. What? I, I, I mean, have these people have been, you know, playing too many video games or watching too many war movies where they're uh, they have thoughts of of honor and glory and don't really understand what people go through uh when they're in the battlefield think about it yeah well <clears throat> it kind of is getting down to actually what is the strategy here and um you know why are they doing this and <clears throat> well i'm going to ask you and ask your ask your audience yeah. Are you ready to send, you know, are, are people uh, list watching this? Are they ready to send their sons and daughters to go and fight with uh, Russia or to go and fight with China because uh, America has to uh, rule the world? Our, our, our democracy is threatened from within right now. It's not threatened because of, of other great powers. And, and if we continue to spend trillions of dollars in pursuit of dragons to slay around the world. And, you know, as we conjure up these enemies, Saddam Hussein was an enemy, three to six trillion dollars, depending on who you talk to for that war. Yeah. You, you look at so, Muammar Gaddafi, enemy. Shah uh, Assad, enemy. Enemy, so enemy, enemy. Putin, an enemy. Z, an enemy. Well, you know, after a while, the question has to be asked. 
Well, if, um, if everywhere uh, we look, uh, we see enemies, uh, uh, our our um, our vulnerability as a nation is going to increase because we're going to run out of friends. And people say, well, what about Europe? Well, let me tell you, when people are freezing in Germany this uh, winter because of sanctions and, uh, and, and a destruction of a pipeline, uh, they're going to wonder why didn't somebody try diplomacy before they moved to those measures. Yeah. So at any rate, so that's, uh, that's one thing I think Ro Khanna said. He said, like, uh, Putin is our preeminent enemy, <laughs> right? Well, since when is Putin our enemy? Like, what has Russia ever done to us? You know, and, uh, you know, they always have to have an enemy and it's, it's, they're the, the next Hitler. It's like, it's like a cowboy movie, right? Every war they have, it's always like a big cowboy movie, the way they, they sell it. So at any rate, but. I don't um, think, you know, as bad as the cowboy movies were, uh, they, uh, uh, they, they never dwelt on the destruction of, of the world. Uh, yeah. It's bad enough they were dealing with the destruction of native peoples, but, you know, we're talking about the destruction of the world here as, as this has the potential to escalate out of control with people who aren't particularly deep thinkers based on their, um, uh, the, uh, the practice of, of uh, governance that we're seeing on display. So I want to get back to that. Uh, you know, what's actually, what is their strategy? And I, I had uh, Jeffrey Sachs on, uh, actually, it's going to broadcast today. Today's the uh, 31st, and then this will show next week. But um, Jeffrey Sachs, one of the things that he said was that uh, there's a very small handful of people that are running U.S. war policy. And he didn't really name names, but... Uh, you know, he did in an article and uh, he just basically told who they are. They're the neocons and they're the same neocons that uh, were in the Bush administration. And it all goes back to the uh, project on the new American century. And, uh, you know, they, all, they laid it all out and all the countries that they said they were gonna overthrow, they have overthrown, you know, Libya and Syria and, uh, Iraq and Iran, they're, well, I haven't done Iran yet, but at any rate, they've been targeted by these neocons. And I wanted to read a little bit from this. Sure. Article. Um, okay, so this is uh, Jeffrey Sachs, and it's, uh, it's from Other News, Voices from the Tide. So um, uh, Ukraine is the latest neocon disaster. The war in Ukraine is the culmination of a 30-year project of the American neoconservative movement. The Biden administration is packed with the same neocons who championed the U.S. wars of choice in Serbia, 1999, Afghanistan, 2001, Iraq, 2003, Syria, 2011, Libya, 2011, and who did so much to provoke Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The neocon track record is one of unmitigated disaster, yet Biden has staffed his team with neocons. As a result, Biden is steering Ukraine, the US and the European Union towards yet another geopolitical debacle. If Europe has any insight, it will separate itself from these US foreign policy debacles. The neocon movement emerged in the 1970s around a group of public intellectuals, several of whom were influenced by University of Chicago political scientist Leo Strauss and Yale University classicist Donald Kagan. Neocon leaders included Norman Podertz, Irving Kristol, Paul Wolfowitz, Robert Kagan, son of Donald, Frederick Kagan, son of Donald, Victoria Newland, wife of Robert, Elliot Cohen, Elliot Abrams, and Kimberly Allen Kagan, wife of Frederick. The main message of the neocons is that the U.S. must predominate in military power in every region of the world 
and must confront rising regional powers that could someday challenge U.S. global or regional dominance, most important Russia and China. For this purpose, U.S. military force should be prepositioned in hundreds of military bases around the world, and the U.S. should be prepared to lead wars of choice as necessary. The United Nations is to be used by the U.S. only when useful for U.S. purposes. The approach was spelled out first by Paul Wolfowitz in his draft defense policy guidance, written for the Department of Defense in 2002. The draft called for extending the U.S.-led security network to the Central and Eastern Europe, despite the explicit promise by German Foreign Minister Hans Dietrich Genscher in 1990 that German unification would not be followed by NATO's eastward enlargement. Wolfowitz also made the case for American wars of choice, defending America's right to act independently, even alone, in response to crises of concern to the U.S. According to General Wesley Clark, Wolfowitz already made clear to Clark in May 1991 that the U.S. would lead regime change operations in Iraq, Iraq, Syria, and other former Soviet allies. Neocons championed the NATO enlargement to Ukraine even before that became official U.S. policy under George W. Bush, Jr. in 2008. They viewed Ukraine's NATO membership as key to U.S. regional and global dominance. So I'll stop there. And it kind of lays it all out. And there's another document, and that is the um, Rand Corporation document, overextending and unbalancing Russia, assessing the impact of cost-imposing options. And this was, I think this was 2019 that this came out, but you know, it kind of lays out what the whole U.S. strategy is. And I think in this document, it says that uh, if they go so far as to actually cause Russia to invade Ukraine, that they're going to lose. Yeah, so they already know in advance that they're going to lose, but they're still doing it. Why are they still doing it? You know, you have to go back to um, <clears throat> the um, strategy to try to keep Russia fighting in Afghanistan. Yeah, you know, uh, that was a way of draining of of draining the um, the grand uh, chessboard that, that government's uh, strength, so that they're kept weaker. Uh, you know, no no mention of the carnage that was visited upon the people of Af Afghanistan. I, I think uh, uh, you know what Jeffrey Sachs uh, writes about with respect to the project for the new American century. Uh, you know, I, I was, of course, aware of that as we were moving towards war against Iraq. Now, Iraq didn't have anything to do with 9-11, as, but I, back then, in October of uh, 2002, as a matter of fact, precisely October 2nd, 2002, anybody goes to the internet, type in Dennis Kucinich, analysis of Iraq war, October 2nd, 2002, it'll be an eye opener because you'll see that back then, I was able to determine, just through my own research, chapter and verse, why the call for war against Iraq was a lie, and uh, that Iraq uh, had uh, nothing to do with 9-11, or Al-Qaeda's role in 9-11, didn't have the intention or capability of attacking the U.S., and didn't have weapons of mass destruction that famously led us to, uh, to bomb them. As a result, uh, you know, 46, uh, perhaps 4,700 U.S. Uh, servicemen and women were killed uh, in that war, tens of thousands injured, and over a million innocent Iraqis died uh, through the war. A million people. I mean, you, you have to, you know, one's thinking has to expand to think about a million people. Um, and the cost uh, was over $3 trillion. Now, uh, not a small matter when you consider the needs of the American people. So this uh, group that Sachs cites, well, th this war ex extended from their thinking. 
in a way that, that they helped birth the war with their philosophy. So what follows? Well, today, obviously, we need a new policy, a new philosophy of governing that, that takes us away from war, <clears throat> that leads us to work with the community of nations to, uh, to find ways to resolve the challenges that we all face, you know, beginning with uh, what's happening with the global climate. So when you, when you, um, uh, you know, each nation has its own interests, but we must no longer be in a position where we're imposing our values on other countries, where we're imposing our interests or threatening other countries because they're not serving our interests. Hey, you know, we need a new uh, start here as a country, or we follow this path of continual war, of continual instigating conflict, and there'll be a point at which uh, we'll lose our country. I, I mean, this is people say, well, that's not possible. Let me tell you, the no matter how much money we have, no matter how many arms we we think we can use, there are other countries that also have uh, the ability to uh, to visit havoc on this country if we continue on the path that we're on. So yeah, I favor diplomacy. Um, and apparently it hasn't been tried. Yeah, well, you know, there's been five attempts to uh, negotiate with Putin and, uh, you know, the, uh, the United States doesn't seem to want to, uh, the United States and Britain, you know, doesn't seem to want to, uh, uh, let it allow it to happen, right? So, because uh, you know, they uh, the, uh, they negotiated, there was a negotiation between uh, Zelensky and Putin in March, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Prime Minister of, of uh, Britain came over there and told them the deal was off, you know, that they wouldn't support Ukraine if they went through with it. So, so anyway, the United States, this is their, um, you know, strategy is prolonged war. They don't want to stop that. They they basically admitted it, and uh, you know that you know they they started this war back when they overthrew the government in 2014, and and uh, I really wasn't aware that uh, uh, Victoria Newland, you know, Victoria Newland. Uh, was caught in that uh, conversation with the U.S. ambassador where they were discussing who the next president of uh, Ukraine was going to be, you know, and it was a phone call and it was somehow intercepted and it, it went viral, right? This was two weeks before the Maidan coup. So, uh, you know, and then this is all laid out in Oliver Stone's documentary, um, Ukraine on Fire. It's, it's in living color. It's the best thing I've seen yet to actually nails this but um uh victorian victoria newland says here that she was the wife of um robert kagan now, i didn't know that well look uh you know of course there are a number of relationships that get explored in this but i i want to say that having seen um Oliver Stone's work, Ukraine on Fire, it's worth a watch for anybody who hasn't seen it, look at it because it really uh, gives you a, a good, uh, it helps provide a, a good understanding of the trajectory of the conflict. There's something else I wanted to talk to you about, which is uh, a friend of mine, uh, an old friend of mine, she's like 86, uh, from the Democratic Party and, uh, you know, other activist organizations always brings up about this two trillion dollars that uh was disclosed by donald rumsfeld uh in 2001 and she says that's the elephant in the room if you're not talking about that missing two trillion dollars from the defense budget then you know you can't address anything and that's that's the, the heart of the problem according to her so there's, I went and looked and I found this article from the uh, City Journal that's talking about this. And it's, quote, on September 10th, 2001, then U.S. Secretary of 
Defense Donald Rumsfeld disclosed that his department was unable to account for roughly $2.3 trillion worth of transactions. Quote, in 1999, the amount that the Pentagon adjusted was eight times the Defense Department budget for that year. It was one-third greater than the entire federal budget, unquote. By 2015, this is, you know, I'm just reading different parts of this. The amount reported missing by the Office of the Inspector General had increased to $6.5 trillion. And that was just the, for the Army. Using public data from federal databases, Mark Skidmore, a professor of economics at Michigan State University, found that $21 trillion in unsupported adjustments had been reported by the Defense and Housing and Urban Development Departments between 1998 and 2015. That's about $65,000 for every American, unquote. And, uh, you know, I might point out this is, this is a, unconstitutional. It says in the Constitution, they have to account for every penny, right? Uh, right. And I'm just wondering uh, if you had some idea about this, because, you know, uh, you were really concerned about this type of thing. Well, let me tell you, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons why I chose to be on the Government Reform Committee uh, in 1997. We held a hearing, and that was 97, where we determined uh, through a, an inspector general's report presented to the committee that over tr a trillion, T for trillion dollars in taxpayers' dollars that went to the Pentagon could not be, uh, the expenditures couldn't be accounted for. So they didn't know where the money how it was spent, where it went. Turned out that the Pentagon had over 1,100 different accounting systems. In a way, one could speculate that the accounting was set up uh, so that uh, no one could keep track of the money. If that's what they intended to do, they succeeded spectacularly. On the other hand, uh, the obligation that Congress and administration have to, um, uh, to protect the taxpayer's interest has not been met. As a matter of fact, taxpayers have been disregarded repeatedly in these uh, various uh, Pentagon budgets. Uh, it wasn't only, so today, you know, I imagine the amount is uh, uh, several trillions of dollars that hasn't uh, been accounted for. Uh, people pay taxes and the government uh, collects the taxes and then it creates a budget and dispenses this money. And the largest recipient of those funds is the Department of Defense. And the idea is that this is somehow connected to our, our country being protected. Uh, but the truth of the matter is uh, that when you have that kind of money that they can't account for, uh, government isn't keeping good faith with the people. People work hard for that money. People are having trouble making ends meet. And the government's spending money like it's, uh, you know, going out of control. And I think that uh, we need a measure of discipline now. We are expected, every one of us has to have a certain budget to make our household work. Uh, we, we are not permitted to spend money we don't have. We'll get in the trouble we do that. Uh, we have a um, obligation at the end of the year. We, we have to pay taxes every April 15th. We're, we have to mail it in. If you mail in a tax uh, uh, return that says that, uh, that the government determines that you didn't pay enough taxes, well, they'll give you a penalty. They'll raise hell with you until you pay the money. Now imagine, think about that next, uh, rather April 15th, think about that next April 15th, when you uh, keep in mind that the government has trillions of dollars they can't account for. Think about the money that's going to Ukraine right now, uh, $65 billion. 
the Helsinki Commission staff report of a few years ago uh, determined that Ukraine was one of the most corrupt countries in the world, okay? So I don't know uh, if somebody's already corrupt is giving them billions more gonna make them honest. And the, according to the latest inspector general account uh, they still don't know where this money's going. That's getting shipped over there. Yeah, it's a bit what simple. It about? Um, People are suffering in this country and we're, we're giving money away and we don't even keep track of it. Yeah, there's been several media reports about this, although you don't hear a lot about it. But, um, you know, uh, Zelensky himself is a billionaire and owns property all over the world, is exposed by the Panama Papers is uh, supported by Ukraine's most powerful oligarch, Igor Kol Kolomoisky, recently banned from the United States. And uh, he is a close business partner and uh, the main benefactor of the current president. Yeah, well, there's a couple of hotels in Cleveland that Kolomoisky uh, uh, helped purchase that are now in receivership. So you, you, look- And he's this... behind the, the right sector. You know, he's supporting the right sector militia. It's like one of the well, main look, benefits. you can anything you look at here. Uh, we're told don't pay any attention to it because we got to defeat Russia. Yeah, so where's so all maybe that we need going? to pay. Maybe we need to pay attention to the corruption because you know corruption tends to be symmetrical. Uh, if you if you have corruption in one part, you probably have corruption in the other part too, and you know it's it's pervasive here. And we, the American people, are paying for it, not just in Ukraine, but, you know, anywhere we're sending money around the world, uh, you, you can go into anywhere the money's spent, anywhere. And, I, and I'll be able to show you, if I had enough time with the books, how the money's being misspent. I mean, a whole government's set up this way, and it's wrong. It's fundamentally wrong. If we don't care, you know, we don't care. Apparently, the U.S. government doesn't care enough to be straight up with the American people about where their money goes. We, we trust the government. This is our country. And yet the government uh, isn't doing, isn't returning that trust with uh, uh, the kind of fidelity to the attention to how the money is spent. Because if you could give somebody your money, you expect them to watch it. And if the government isn't doing that, then you know we need to find out why not. And we need to change that system. Yeah. So that's a good opportunity to talk about your book. So I want to play this uh, uh, tape that you played last time you were here that some friends of mine invited you to come and talk about uh, taking back the uh, their public utility. And, uh, and so you have lots of experience in, in this because you ran as the mayor of Cleveland on that issue, taking back the public issue, the public utility. And uh, this actually uh, turned out to be way more of a fight than anybody thought. And uh, it, it's almost like going up against the mafia, you know, as we're sitting here, we're talking about actually, going to give some up. <laughs> Yeah, and, and so I wanna play this tape Dennis Kucinich is the youngest big city mayor in the United States, and as you might have read in the major news magazines recently, he is shaking up Cleveland these days, even though the mayor has been in office only a couple of months. Uh, Newsweek magazine, in writing about you recently, uh, called you uh, Dennis the Menace. How did you react to that terminology? They're right. Who are you a menace to? Crooks. Kucinich had, quote, caused considerable problems for local dishonest businessmen, politicians, and criminals. The story of organized crime and a plan to kill former Cleveland Mayor Dennis Kucinich. A convicted hitman for the mob, he says he was offered the job of killing Mayor Kucinich. But you said you were willing, you were willing to do it. Sure, everybody's going to make a living. What kind of money uh, might have been offered for something like that? Well, if I was to do it, I would want at least 80 grand. I know it sounds ridiculous and high, but you got to go by what position a guy holds or what his life's worth. Why do you think these people would have wanted to do uh, the mayor in? We can't, we can't buy percentage. 
this one I was told, we can't buy a croissant. He was cut from a different cloth, and uh, they didn't know where he was coming from, what angle he was coming from. So, uh, you know, they had to work different ways on him. That sounded pretty serious, huh? I can't get no more serious than that. He said, there's a light plant in Cleveland, and if that plant can be sold, some people are going to make a lot of money, and Kucinich is stopping them from selling that plant. I can't get no more serious than that. Headlines throughout the media broadcast the battle between the Kucinich administration and privately owned CEI over who would own the city's municipal power plant. While Muni was the issue, it was Cleveland's banking community that applied heavy pressure on 31-year-old Mayor Dennis Kucinich to sell the power plant or they wouldn't refinance the city's outstanding bond debt. But doggone it, somebody tells me about the disastrous results of default. What are the disastrous results of loss of freedom? And that's what's at stake here. Known as the people's mayor, Kucinich rallied hundreds of people to join him in withdrawing his savings from Cleveland Trust. This bank is trying to destroy a city government through blackmail and intimidation. I'm taking my money out because I don't want clean money in a bank which is dirty. In 1978, when he refused to sell the municipal light system, the banks to which the city owed money refused to renew their loans unless he gave in. The ball is squarely in your court. The mayor, if you will sign that resolution, we have Cleveland Trust saying that we can have $50 million in city bonds, which will permanently end, according to Mr. Russo, city's financial crisis. This is quite an offer from Cleveland Trust, considering the hour, considering the day. What are you going and to do? especially considering the fact that everyone says Muni Light's not worth anything. It's a significant offer, certainly. Uh, strange that they would want to cause the default of the city of Cleveland over a light system that's worth nothing. And all I have to do is sign my name to this paper. And we have the whole city back again. Baloney. I'm trying to prove that government can work. Yes, sir. So you said back in the 70s you were elected based on a promise to keep Muni. Right. What was what was the public interest behind that? Why were, why was the public so interested? The in rates were 20 percent cheaper. Okay. Uh, and to 25 percent cheaper, and they provided they saved the taxpayers money because it was cheaper street lighting and cheaper uh, cost to electricity. Thank you for asking that. The um, and and people were really able to save money. Now in Cleveland, think about this, the utilities competed house to house. Uh, Muni Light had, had about a third of the, the city where it was, it was concentrated. And the fact that um, we were able to save it was miraculous because we finally went to the ballot when people didn't understand about the default, that's one of the reasons why I wasn't reelected. And uh, but I did ask the people to support keeping Muni Light in a ballot issue. And we were losing, um, according to polls, we were getting defeated two to one. But because we drove home the issue of people saving, of having accountability, and reliability, and things like that. Um, we had this miracle occur where we actually won the issue by two to one. And, and those were polls, you know, in, a, in an election, as opposed to a poll that had been taken six, six weeks earlier. The story, by the way, of Muni Light is, is one, you know, again, I'm, I've been working on this uh, for decades and finally finished it. And after seeing a trailer that we're using to promote uh, the book and maybe some other things with it, but uh, it happened, and, and it, it, it's, it's a cautionary tale about what's at stake here. So I'm wondering, I was always curious, as to what happened to this guy that was the hitman that they hired to knock you off, and uh, also what happened to the people that, were hi that hired him, right? Because from what I understand, you were in your uh, dining room eating dinner and a bullet came through the window. Well, look, uh, you know, I, 
I've always been uh, grateful that I was able to survive that period. Uh, but what was it all about? It was all about uh, a monopoly utility trying to get control of the city's utility so they could uh, make millions more charging the people in the city more for electricity. Our city utility, uh, known as MuniLite, also known as uh, legally as the Division of Light and Power. That's the, that's the, uh, that's the title of the book, uh, The Division of Light and Power. Uh, this, this book, uh, which by the way is very, you know, it, it's well documented. Uh, I was elected mayor on a promise to save our municipal utility from a takeover, which had already been consummated by the previous mayor. But I was elected mayor to save Muni Light and, uh, and my election, I first act in office, I canceled the sale. That should have been the end of the story. It was just the beginning because the Cleveland Electric Illuminating Company through their law firms and their partners in the business community, namely banks, put enormous pressure on me as this young mayor and, uh, and did everything to destabilize the city government. Comes December 15th, 1978, after, um, uh, after assa assassination attempts and, um, and one plot that was exposed and um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of danger on December 15, 1978, the head of the biggest bank who came out of, um, uh, out of the west, out of the Northwest coast, uh, uh, you know, one of the big banks there, or, or no, one of the, one of the big, uh, the biggest utility out there. Um, I'll think of the name of it in a minute. Anyhow, Brockweir was his name. And he was the head of Cleveland Trust which then was the largest bank in the state of Ohio, the 33rd largest bank in America. He tells me, look, you got to sell this electric system or we're not going to renew the city's credit on loans I hadn't even taken out. So they were going to put the city into default unless I sold Muni Light. Now people in Cleveland were relying on me to do everything I could to keep the cost of electricity low. But if I sold Muni Light, everybody's electric rates were going to go up. So they'd be at parity with whatever the private company was. And to keep, a, keep in mind, again, Muni Light's rates were anywhere from 15 to 20% lower than the Cleveland Electric Illuminating Company, private company. So I took a stand on behalf of people who, for whom it matters how much they pay for electricity. And I could not permit a, a, a private corporation, no matter how powerful, to tell me. What, what I had to do as the terms of my staying in office. So I said, no, I, it was incredible pressure. And um, I said, no. And uh, they put the city of Cleveland into default as a result. And I was smeared uh, for years and years about it, you know, unfortunately. And it took me 15 years to make a political comeback because I lost the next election. Uh -huh. So, uh, what happened to those people? Did did uh, are they in jail? Well, I'm, the person I'm sure, I'm sure they're all in heaven, heaven right now. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, but I mean, they caught the guy that took the shot at you. Oh no, no. Well, you know, they. I can tell you that um, uh, the um, um, you know, one of the persons who was involved eventually uh, died in prison. So uh, there, there was no prosecution, no. Yeah. Listen, uh, you know, if you're going to represent people, don't sell them out like a cardinal principle of uh, public life. Don't be afraid to take a stand. Don't sell out the people. Now, I will tell you, Ed, uh, you know, everything that I learned in Cleveland and fighting the same uni light, I took those same, that same experience with me in the Congress. And that's what enabled me to take a stand against this powerful uh, um, political uh, organization known as the White House and Congress and say the Iraq war is wrong.
Yeah. So, you know, Cleveland was very, very good uh, training. And people in Seattle well understand the importance of public power, you know? Yeah. I mean, Seattle has Seattle City Light, uh, uh, serves uh, Shoreline, right. uh, Lake Forest Park, uh, some of the other areas. Uh, most, most of Washington has uh, public utilities. It's, it's just, Washington, it's, in some ways, uh, you know, has led the nation in appreciating um, the power of trying to, you know, the importance of lower utility rates. Yeah, we have very low power rates compared to the rest of the country. And it makes a difference. I mean, the reason why Muni Light was established in the first place was to attract business, because how do you attract business if your <coughs> utility rates are through the roof? Yeah. So I just have a... Uh, one more question. This, this, we have about two minutes. So uh, this is going to show November 7th, the day before the election. And, uh, you know, in view of, you know, how the DNC Democrats, you know, have let us all down and everything, you know, uh, maybe you can to have put in your two cents on why people should still vote for Democrats. Well, I'm, you know, look, there are some good congresspersons who deserve your support, period. But, you know, I've, I've stayed away from um, the, um, this particular election season. Um, and I'm frankly disappointed with the administration dragging us into uh, a war that could spiral out of control. <coughs> so, you know, I'm not waving a flag this time. Yeah. I want to see what direction are going to take us. And, you know, I'm not satisfied. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, thanks so much for all your time. <laughs> and, um, you know, you're still one of my favorite congressmen. Well, Ed, thank you. And I'm sorry that uh, this, uh, I, I mean, I'm glad I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. Thank you. Okay, yes.